Hey, welcome back. I'm so glad that you took some time out of the middle of your week to stop in and join us once again. I hope everything's going well for you this week. And uh, I just want to give a personal invite for you to reach out and contact me if you would like to uh, give me some feedback or if you just simply like to chat and talk about what you've heard so far or what you've seen. I'd like to, to hear from you personally. So as you see there on the screen, my information on how to get a hold of me is shown. I, I urge you to take advantage of that and keep it. And if there's any time that you'd like to connect with me, please do so. I'll be waiting. Anyways, before we begin tonight's session, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just so grateful that you have provided for us every step of the way, everything that we've needed. Now, Lord, here we are in the middle of the week, and Lord, we just are now turning to you once again, opening up your word. And so we just ask, God, that your spirit speak to each one of us. Give us what we need tonight to grow more in you. We thank you for your book called the Bible that you passed down through the generations, Lord, and you pre preserved it for us to read tonight. Now open up our eyes and our ears to heaven so we can hear your voice and we glorify you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Tonight's title is The Messiah and the Judgment. The Messiah and the Judgment. And I want to begin with looking at some famous last words that some influential people have said right before they passed away. That's right, famous last words that were said by influential people before they passed away. It's kind of interesting. And here we see Marie Antoinette, the wife of King Louis XVI of France. She was executed in the French Revolution, and this is what she said before she died. Pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose. That was her last words. And then we see Alexander the Great's last words. To the strongest was his. And then these are the famous last words of Todd Beamer, one of the heroes of 9-11 on that fateful flight. Are you guys ready? Let's roll. Then Henry Ford said, I'll sleep well tonight. Of course, who can forget John Lennon? He said these words, I'm shot, I'm shot. And comedian Groucho Marx reported to say these words, die my dear, why, that's the last thing I'll do. And then who can forget this person, the king, Elvis Presley, and his famous last words was, I'm going to the bathroom to read. And that's the last thing that he did. However, I want to tell you tonight that another king, he had some famous last words for us too. The everlasting gospel, that's right. God has left his last day message in the Bible. Those are his famous last words. And before Jesus returns to this earth, this message is going to go around the whole planet, all over the earth. Those are his famous last words, the promises to us. But unfortunately, this is the sad truth. Those words have been ignored time and time again. Remember, we said this in our last presentation, there's an unseen battle that's taking place all around us. We don't see it, though. It's in the unseen world between the evil angels and their desire to tempt us and to lead us astray. The enemy of God, Satan, knows that once we open up this powerful book called the Bible, he will be exposed. But yet, that's why we keep opening it up. And that's why I'm going to open it up tonight again, because we're going to keep exposing Satan, his deceptions, and his lies. Because the word must go out. The good news tonight, friends, is that this word of truth is going out all around this world, all over the planet people are receiving the gospel as we speak. Keep something in mind. The focus on this book that we're looking at throughout the series, the book of Revelation, is all about Jesus. At the beginning of the book, it says in many Bibles something like this. The revelation 
of St. John the Divine. But that simply means that John wrote it. Revelation 1 verse 1 is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. This is a book about Christ given by God. And guess what? We're told if we read it, we will be blessed. And if we hear and we keep the things that are written in it. You see, Jesus is revealed in many different ways throughout the book of Revelation. He's revealed as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Also, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, those are just a few of the examples of how he's revealed. As we go through the book of Revelation, as we open it up, we see in Revelation, Jesus is shown walking among the candlesticks. And the candlesticks in this book represent the churches. In the book of Revelation, there are seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When we get to Revelation chapter 4, is a picture of heaven with praise being offered to God. Then we go to Revelation chapter 5, and Jesus is both the lion and the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the lamb that has been slain. Jesus is also pictured as a mighty conqueror, the overcomer, the powerful one, because he died for the sins of the world. And that's why the angels cry out, Worthy is the Lamb. When we get to Revelation chapter 13, we see there's a prophecy of a beast, an image of the beast, and then also a mark of the beast. We read if we follow the beast, worship the beast, and receive the mark of the beast, we won't be saved. Then we flip over to Revelation chapter 14, and there's a sharp contrast, the shift focus from the beast to the creature, or the creature, to our creator, to where it ought to be, on Christ himself, because Christ is the creator. We are called to recognize him as such and turn our attention back to him. And that's what we see in Revelation chapter 14. And here, Revelation chapter 14, we see God's great famous last words. So let's take a look. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 says this, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In Revelation, angels are messengers. And here in the book of Revelation, they are seen flying with a worldwide message. You know why? Because God wants to capture our attention. It's the everlasting gospel. It's not bad news. It's good news. It's wonderful news. You know what? The best part of it, it's free to receive. Made possible by God's grace alone. Through faith in, in Jesus Christ. We move on to Revelation 14, verse 7. And then we, we notice these words. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, because the hour of His judgment has arrived. And worship the one who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Well, what does it mean to fear God? Does that mean that we need to, to tremble and do we need to shake our knees because we're trembling in fear? No, fear God does not mean that, especially in this text. Fear here represents our response to what God has done for us. We literally stand in awe of who he is. That's what it means to fear God. Remember, in the previous session, we talked about everything that God has done for us, even when we hadn't, hadn't deserved it. We talked a lot about God's grace. And he came after us time and time again, after we chose to turn our backs on him. And that's God's grace. And what this verse is telling us here is once we recognize grace and, and believe in the power behind that grace, it creates within us a, des a desire to follow him. And we stand in awe, in reverence. And that's what it simply means when it says, fear God and give him glory. The truth is, because after we recognize everything God has done for us, we come to the quick uh, resolution that nobody else deserves it but him. We also see these words, because the hour of his judgment have come. Now, we're going to come back to those words and just a little bit. So keep that right there in the forefront of your, your mind for just a, a few moments. We'll come back to those. 
And then we also see these words, and worship the one who has made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. To put this in the most simplistic terms possible, what the angel is telling John is that that the last day message, God's message of saving grace will go out to the whole world. There is nothing that's going to be able to stop his message. And I'm telling you tonight, nothing is stopping his message. This is just a prime example of it. We're not here face to face. We're all separated right now. We're in our own living rooms, our own bedrooms. Wherever we're at, it doesn't matter because God's message is still going out. Whatever the enemy tries to do to disrupt that, it won't work because God is way more powerful than that. And then we're all called to to worship God alone. You know, apparently, there's been someone that's been trying to rob God of worship. But wait a second. We talked about that in the last session, didn't we? That Satan tried to rob God of his glory in heaven, and that's why he was cast down from heaven, trying to rob God of his worship, of his glory. He desired to be God, and he desired God's worship. Verse 8 goes on to say this, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And just as the ancient Babylon fell, when Belshazzar was the king, so these words are saying that a modern-day Babylon will fall too. And God warns us to not be tied up with spiritual Babylon, the, the type of Babylon that's being referenced here in this text. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that more later as well. Then there was a third angel. Revelation 14.9 says these words. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of wrath of God. In other words, that person cannot possibly be saved, but absolutely must be lost. That is significant for us to catch on to. Now, why does God give these three angels' message? Well, I'm telling you tonight, he's giving them because he desires everyone to be saved. That's right. God wants every single person on this planet to be saved. There's not a reason why anyone should be lost. The message is going to go out. Everybody will hear this message. But the truth is, sadly, not everybody will want to receive the message. But the question is, are you wanting to receive that message? The evidence that this message is being proclaimed right now, not only here in North Iowa, but all around the world, testifies that it's decision time. His message is going to go out. And it is. Revelation 14, 12 says also these words, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of of Jesus. The end result of those who receive and accept that gospel message is a group of people that will have endured, they'll have patience, and they have allowed God to complete the work that he desires to complete in each person. They also are a group of people that keep God's commandments, and they have lived out the faith of Jesus in their lives. So the end result is people who have reasoned that their way was useless. So they surrendered to the will of God. The end result is also a group of people who have become acquainted with God's voice. They keep his commandments. On the battlefield, we need to know which voice to listen to, don't we? So we have to know the voice of the commander. The one who's giving us the commands, the life-sustaining commands. It's life or death. Then also, we, the, the end-time people, their lives will be characterized because they're li- they live their faith in Jesus. Nobody else. They don't put their hope and trust in, in anybody else but Jesus. So tonight, I want to urge us all to lay down our lives at the feet of Jesus. Don't follow Babylon and its confusion. Follow Jesus. Don't worship the beast. Worship Christ. God says, there is a God who loves you. 
When we go back to these words, though, I want us to take a close look at them. It says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Clearly, this has something to do with preparing everybody to be ready and to stand in the presence of God's judgment. And this is actually a good thing, that God is giving us this message to be prepared. There is no reason for us not to be prepared because we have these words right in front of us today. It is by grace that we are saved, but we have to receive that grace. It's like if somebody would bring us a plate of food, for it to, to go into our, our bodies and nourish us, we have to take the food, we have to receive it. So someone just standing in front of us with a plate of, of good food and just taking the smell in and knowing that it's the, the best platter we've ever seen, that's not going to give us life. We have to receive it. But the good news, we have that thing called free choice that we can exercise every day, every moment of the day. The book of Daniel also speaks about this thing called judgment that we just talked about. And John builds on what Daniel wrote. In Daniel chapter 7, when we go back there, we see a picture of judgment already taking place, already in process. So let's look at the words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him the court was seated and the books were opened I want to take you to another passage of scripture we find this in 2 Corinthians 5 10 it says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ every single one of us and then of course in Acts 17 31 it says these words he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Solomon sums everything up here in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes in two verses, saying in chapter 12, verse 13, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. He's basically saying here, this is our duty. This is man's all. In verse 14, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So these verses that I just shared with you all testify that there is going to be a judgment one day. And there is nothing that won't be brought up, whether it's in the, the darkest place or it uh, doesn't matter where we hide. God is always with us he sees us revelation 14 7 puts it like this fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come it will be said one day that judgment time is here in revelation 22 jesus says as he's coming back to earth in power and glory and behold i am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work literally Jesus is saying to you and to me, he's coming back, and we already are investigating this truth, and we see that he's coming back soon, but he's coming with a reward. He's going to give everybody what is due to each individual, either eternal life or tragically, death. But the good news, it doesn't have to be the second one. We can choose life. When we open up the Bible, we'll notice something interesting, though. Judgment is all through the Bible. Believe that? It is. In fact, we talked about that last session. Adam and Eve sinned, and then we saw what happened. God had to come down. He came down and rescued them by giving them a promise, by giving them grace, but still they had to take ownership. It's called taking responsibility for their actions, and judgment was passed down. But what we see is God saved them from self-destructing because that's what sin does. He gave them a, a promise, a hope for the future. We also see in the story the Tower of Babel. God came down to, to see what was going on, wondering why this huge tower was being constructed. 
all the way up into the clouds, into the heavens. Not literally into the star, starry heavens, but into the clouds. That was what was called heavens. And God saw that these people were full of themselves. In fact, they wanted to be God themselves. And there, he exercised his judgment. And they had to take responsibility for their own actions. But yet, God didn't wipe them out. He didn't destroy them. But he saved humanity from self-destructing through his judgment. And then God came back down to earth again to see what was happening in this scene. And Sodom and Gomorrah. And what were those sins that were existing? Well, the book of Jeremiah says that people were arrogant. They were overfed. They were unconcerned. They didn't care about the poor, so they weren't helping the poor. They were full of hatred and anger, so quickly stirred with those things. And they also did the most vile and unthinkable things before the eyes of the Lord. Does that kind of sound familiar with what's going on in certain places of our world today? Well, God came down and he exercised judgment. Yet he didn't kill everybody. In fact, he spared those who were righteous, those who followed him. And then we see in this story, before God sent the great flood on earth, God came down to see what was taking place. Of course, what he, what he saw then was another scene of how the world had forgotten about him, about the creator. They had forgotten about God's grace that was given all the way back in the garden to Adam and Eve, to all humanity. They were so consumed with the here and now, only selfish ambitions, a me-first attitude. I mean, this is how the Bible puts it. Based on the evidence, God could have wiped out everybody, but he spared the righteous ones. And once again, God exercised his judgment. Now, for those of you who are still thinking, you know, well, God is such a cruel God, but yet these are the same comments that are made by people that, that are so upset with God that he doesn't put uh, an end to the injustice and to the, the murderings and, and the people that do the most vile acts. But I'm telling you, we just read stories on God that put an end to all those things. Injustice, senseless murders, lying, cheating, and steal. You see, God is a just God. He doesn't allow those things to keep going on because it pains him at his core to see people treating other people like that. So God is a just God. Like I proposed the question in the previous session, the question should be, why does God give you and me life? Well, let's go on. Based on the ev evidence here, talking about everything in the context of, of judgment, what does that tell us about our God? What does it tell us about now here we are in 2020 and God hasn't stepped in and he hasn't wiped out a whole great population of people? He, no, he's given us many, many years, thousands of years to just simply read his word, acknowledge it, acknowledge his grace, and then come to a repentance Surrender to him because he is so patient. He's been very patient with us to recognize his saving grace. That's right. God continues to give us grace and life. However, in the book of Daniel, God set a date for a final judgment that would come. You see, sin can't go on forever, friends. It just can't. God's merciful. And part of his mercy is not allowing us to self-destruct because that's where sin takes us. So sin cannot last forever. It's too self-destructive. Daniel chapter 8, 14 says these words then, talking about the final judgment. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It, may, it might not say 1965 or the year 2000, but I'm telling you, this date right here is a date for God's judgment that we just read. But what does it mean when the, the words are, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Well, I want to remind you in the Bible, we read about two sanctuaries. There's an earthly sanctuary that was mobile. It was a very important sanctuary. And that's where the Hebrews uh, that worshipped. And later it was, was replaced, re replaced by a, a temple that was constructed. 
And then also we read in the Bible that there's a heavenly sanctuary, and that's God's temple in heaven. You see, the earthly sanctuary was this designed to teach God's people about the plan of salvation. And there within that earthly sanctuary, there were sacrifices and feasts. Uh, we had a, a priests and high priests that would go in there, and they wore beautiful garments. And on those garments, especially for the high priests, were 12 beautiful stones. And these stones were symbolic. They represented, represented the 12 tribes uh, that existed. Within the sanctuary itself was just heavy symbolism that pointed to God's plan of salvation from sin. So that's key to, to understand that the earthly sanctuary was very symbolic in every shape and form. In Exodus 25, 8, God said to Moses, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may, that I may dwell among them. In verse 9 of the same chapter, God says, According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. It's very neat to know that the design, the architect of this sanctuary, it wasn't Moses, it was God himself. He laid it out there on how to design this sanctuary. Of course, God did that because that's resembled what the heavenly sanctuary looks like. But God wanted to dwell among the midst of his people. So that's what they did. They assembled an earthly sanctuary. And as you can see in the, the picture here, it was built according to the spe specifications that God gave them. And Moses followed those. The sanctuary was very important. The Jewish way of life was based around the sanctuary service. The sanctuary was surrounded by an outer wall, as you see there, and it comprised of two rooms. The first room was called the holy place, and the second one, which was smaller, was the most holy place. Inside the first compartment, there was, on the right-hand side, a table of showbread, which taught the truth that Jesus is the bread of life. On the left-hand side was the seven-branch candlestick. Jesus is the light of the world. In front, as they went forward towards the most holy place, was the altar of incense. The incense that ascended up towards God represents our prayers going up to God, mixed with the fragrant incense of the righteousness of Christ. Inside was the most holy place, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. On top of the Ten Commandments, on top of the law, was the mercy seat. And that's good news for all of us, because aren't you glad that the law, God's law, and mercy go together. If it was just the law, we would be hopeless. The priest ministered in the holy place every day. In the most holy place, the high priest went once a year. And he did that on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was called the Judgment Day. That was the day that the sanctuary was cleansed. The cleansing of the sanctuary was very important to the people of Israel. The Day of Atonement was the day on which the sins of all the people were blotted out, and it happened once a year. Throughout the year, the sinners would take, uh, they would take their sacrifices, often a lamb, into the sanctuary. Then they would confess their sins over the lamb. The lamb would be killed, his throat cut, and then the blood would flow out. You see, sin brought death, and it brings death, and that's what God wanted them to, to know and understand. And as their sins were confessed over the lamb and the blood, the sin was symbolically transfer, uh, transferred from the sinner to the lamb. The priest then would take some of the sin-laden blood and sprinkle it inside the sanctuary. In that way, the sin was being transferred into the sanctuary. There were other ways of doing this, but generally this is what took place and how it works. So symbolically, because everything is, is symbolic here, the sin had gone from the sinner to the lamb. The sinner was forgiven. The lamb now had the sin and the lamb had to die on account of that. The blood was taken into the sanctuary on a daily basis throughout the year. The sinners were no longer under condemnation for their sins, but the sin was on record inside that sanctuary until the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, there was a great special service 
on which even the record of sin was blotted out. It was called Judgment Day. The truly repentant had the record of sin blotted out on the Day of Atonement. Repentant sinners were at one with God, while those who were not repentant were not. They were cut off, and they were sent away from the congregation. You see, when Daniel says these words, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, every Hebrew knew that Dan what Daniel was talking about. They knew judgment day was coming. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews uh, deals a lot with the services, the temple, the priests, and the high priests. In fact, it says in Hebrews 9, verses 6 and 7, these words, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always, or every day, went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year. That was the day of atonement. That's what that verse is talking about. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. That was the earthly sanctuary service. So what about the, the heavenly sanctuary service? The question is, what is Jesus doing right now? The Bible says Jesus is our heavenly high priest. He ministers, but not to an earthly temple. Jesus ministers in the temple of heaven. So let's read about it again. Hebrews chapter 9, 24 says these words. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Those words for us are important for you and important for me right now. You see, the earthly priests ministered in the earthly tabernacle, but Jesus is our heavenly high priest, and he's ministering to, for us right now in the he heavenly tabernacle. He is there for you, and he's there for me right now. In fact, that's why we call him our advocate. In Hebrews chapter 4, 14, we start to understand much about what Jesus is doing. We see these words. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Have confidence, friends. Have assurance knowing that we have an advocate, we have a friend that is right now praying on our behalf as our intercessor in heaven. We have a high priest. Verse 16 goes on to say, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We are to come boldly. Why? Because Jesus is our friend. That's why we can come to the throne room of grace with boldness. Because that's what he longs for. He longs for people like you and for me to come forward to him. He's already given us the grace. We just have to receive it and come forward with boldness. And just as there was an earthly sanctuary on earth, there is a heavenly sanctuary, as we just mentioned, in heaven. And just as the earthly sanctuary had to be cleansed, the heavenly sanctuary will have to be cleansed likewise. The judgment simply reveals what we have done with the opportunity to choose Jesus or not. The judgment, essentially what it's doing or what it will do is reveal what type of people everybody is. Whether or not we took the opportunity to choose Jesus, to enter into a relationship with him, remember we saw in Revelation that Jesus stands at the door and knocks of our hearts. He simply just wants to come in. So the judgment is going to, to show evidence if we really did take that, uh, that initiative to let Jesus in. The judgment acts kind of like an, an audit. The books are going to be open. They're going to be examined. And heaven is going to look and it's going to see if there's any evidence of a relationship with Jesus. What God will be looking for is, did we want to take time out of our busy lives to, to look and examine at the evidence of his grace when he presented it to us? Did we confess our utter weakness and our need of a Savior in those moments? Or did we allow God to go on and continue the good work inside of us that he promises to complete? 
Those are just a sample of things that he's going to be looking at. Friends, I want to tell you tonight, there is not a single reason that we should not lay hold of the grace of Jesus Christ right now. When would this judgment take place is a question that many people have asked all through the centuries. In fact, it says here, the hour of his judgment has come, but when is that? Well, let's examine. Daniel 8, 14 says these words, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. An angel brought that communication to Daniel. And, it, and as uh, the conversation went on, the angel began to explain more to Daniel what he's talking about. In verse 17, So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now he was speaking, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. Now those are the words of Daniel. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time the end shall be. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Now this was written around 550 B.C. Now God said 2300 days, then it's judgment time. So 2300 days would equate to about six and a half years. But that wouldn't make much sense, would it? No, not really. So how do we uh, come to a, a good understanding of what 2300 days really means? Well, we have to understand in the Bible, when uh, anybody talks time and prophecy together, that there is an application that is used. In fact, when we look at books like Numbers and Ezekiel, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.5 tell us, that a day represents a year. That's very important. This is important for us to remember going forward. A day represents a year in prophecy when we're talking about time. Therefore, 2,300 days would represent 2,300 little literal years. Makes sense because that brings us into the future. Now this was a symbolic time period representing literal years. But Daniel still didn't have all the information. So he, he prayed. And in chapter 9, verse 23, we see the angel revealing some more. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. The vision that the angel is referring to in chapter 9 is, is the one in chapter 8 as well. We can see that in Daniel. And Daniel received a vision in chapter 8, but he didn't quite understand it at the time. So the angel came back, and we see that being played out in chapter 9. So let's look at Daniel chapter 9. It says in verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, this clearly couldn't happen in one year and four months if we were just going to take 70 weeks, for example, so 70 literal, literal weeks. Remember, we have to apply time prophecy. Again, using the, the method that we used just a few moments ago to understand a day for a year proph prophecy, we see that 70 weeks literally it doesn't mean literally 70 week, weeks. It means 490 years. 70 weeks or 70 times 7 days would be 490 years. God was giving Israel 490 years to come to repentance. When did the 490 year prophecy begin though? Well, let's look back at Daniel chapter 9, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem... So let's pause here. So from going forth of a certain commandment, the one to restore and build or rebuild Jerusalem until 
Messiah the Prince. That's important to pick up from. And also, we need to remember that the Bible interprets itself. So right here, right before us tonight, the Bible is answering us all those questions. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. From the time of the decree until the Messiah would come would be 69 weeks or 483 years. Where do we find the decree? Well, let's remember at the beginning of the series, we talked about just how the Bible makes us simplistic for us by interpreting itself. And we see in the book of Ezra that there is a decree in chapter 7, a decree from King Artaxerxes to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the wall. So when was the decree issued is the question. Well, the good news is the people who wrote the, the, uh, the scrolls back in that time, the Persians, they were very meticulous record keeper, keepers. And in 457 B.C., we can see that this is when Nehemiah gets the order to go back, the decree, to rebuild the wall. I want you to notice this graph, though. In 457 B.C., to Messiah the Prince would be 483 years. Those 483 years bring us down to the year 27 A.D., Bearing in mind that the timeline of history goes from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. without a year zero. So let's do a little biblical math here. So when we start in 457 B.C., when the decree was issued and we add 69 weeks or 483 years, we get to 27 A.D. Messiah or Jesus should appear in 27 A.D. The, wor the word Messiah literally means the anointed one. So the question now we have to dis discover is, when was Jesus anointed? Well, the answer is at his baptism. That's when he was anointed. But when was that? Well, we turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. It gives us the answer. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Gal Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Tranconitus and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, and so on. All of these are historical anchor points that validify the authenticity of these accounts in the Bible. So then we go on to read what Luke writes in verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. And then what happened when the heaven was open? Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came down from heaven, which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar. That year was 27 A.D. The fact is, Jesus was baptized right on time in accordance with the prophetic word. Galatians 4.4 4 says that Jesus came in the fullness of time. That means according to the time prophesied. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is baptized, and after his baptism, he says the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. What time could he have been talking about? Well, Jesus could have said, quite easily, I'm talking about the time prophecy. It just was fulfilled. Friends, Jesus' baptism was his way of announcing himself as the Messiah, but in the most gentlest way. Jesus was referring to the time prophecy in Daniel chapter, chapter 9, but that same prophecy predicted the worst times for Jesus ahead as well. So let's go back and look at Daniel chapter 9. It says in verse 26 that after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not from himself. And here's what happened. Jesus was cut off when he died on the cross. Daniel 9.27 says these words, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now the King James says a covenant. The New King James says the, the covenant. It doesn't really matter which one you decide. But here's the truth. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in two. That was monumental because there had always been a divide between man and God. The mediator had always had to be the high priest. Remember that on the Day of Atonement, that one day out of the year, the people's sins were forgiven when they confessed. But Hebrews reminded us that there was a better covenant that came. And these are the words. 
In Hebrews 8.8, 8, Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will complete a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, a new and better covenant. goes on to read, I will put my laws in their minds, and I will inscribe them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. A new and better covenant. A covenant where people will not have to have a human mediator anymore or an earthly high priest to confess their sins. In fact, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system was done away with. No more need for it. And I thank Jesus for that. You and I have something far more superior to any of that tonight. We have access through God's Spirit right now to Jesus, our high priest. There is still more, there, I'm sorry, there is no more need for lamb slaughtering or any more of those feast days or anything like that. The true lamb has come and he was slain. Now let's just go back and recap some of the, the prophecy that we just went over. I don't want you to miss it. There was a decree in 457 B.C. After 69 weeks, Jesus would be anointed which happened when he was baptized in the year of 27 A.D. He died on the cross in the middle of the 70th week. That was 31 A.D. The 70 weeks would then end in 34 A.D. What happened at the end of the 70 weeks, you may be wondering. Well, remember, God gave Israel a time prophecy of 490 years to come to repentance. Well, sadly, they didn't. Well, what happened at the end of the 70 weeks? Well, the Bible makes it very clear as well. Paul and Barnabas, the mighty men of God, were preaching, and they said in Acts 13.46, these words, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn it to the Gentiles. And that's good news for you and for me. Because we're the beneficiaries of that. The privilege of the gospel was taken to the whole world. You see, it was first extended to Israel, but they refused to receive it. They had an appointed role. So God said, of course, Israel, you still can be saved. But my blessings of grace cannot just be limited to you anymore. It's going to the whole world. And after Stephen was stoned, the book of Acts records the stoning the privileges of the whole gospel, the promise given to Abraham way back in Genesis, has now come to everybody, you and to me. We are to take those promises, to receive them. The prophecy is amazing proof that Jesus is the Messiah. The chances of all this prophecy just happening and coming together perfectly, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, he said, when the decree comes, mark off 483 years, and you'll get to when the Messiah is anointed. And Jesus was baptized 483 years after the decree. The whole prophecy is about Jesus, brought by the angel of Gabriel, brought to people like Zacharias and Elizabeth, brought to people like Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, then, of course, the same angel Gabriel brought this prophecy to Daniel. You may be asking yourself right at this moment, though, why is this prophecy important to me? Why is this message even relevant? Well, here's why, friends. Because this message was given before, but it was misinterpreted before as well. First of all, it's important because it validates God's word is true and reliable. That's the biggest reason. Secondly, I want you to note that it describes a tragic condition that were existing in the people of Jesus' day. You know, the truth is they failed to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They were looking for somebody else that would save them from their immediate problems. They wanted that happiness, that short-term happiness and relief right now. They wanted salvation only for the here and now and not what mattered most, their eternal salvation. The first half of the prophecy was designed to get people ready for the coming of Christ. Yet when Jesus came to the earth, people said these words, We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas 
and they rejoiced. They rejected Jesus. Do you see, friends, we are in the last days of earth's history. And the sad truth is many people are confused about who God is tonight. Like in the time of Jesus, people are looking in all the wrong direction for help. They're relying on people that are trust, uh, they, they haven't uh, been deemed trustworthy. They're unreliable, always letting us down. Revelation tells us that there will also be a power called the Antichrist that will be at work in the last days, and that Antichrist is at work. And we'll discuss that later in a series coming up shortly. But the good news that I want you to, to receive and understand tonight is that we can come to the throne room of grace boldly because Christ is our high priest, and he is standing there now, dispensing grace mercy and love and forgiveness for all who will accept it. In fact, the Bible says, come to him, come to him. These prophecies point to him, to Jesus, our Savior, on earth, our mediator and the sanctuary above. Now let's look at prophecy again, and we'll see the rest of the story. You see, if we start in 457, add 490 years, you get to 34 A.D., there are still 1,810 years left. And they bring us down to the year 1844. For more than 150 years, we've been living in the time of heaven's final judgment, the time when the Messiah, Jesus, entered the heavenly sanctuary to prepare a people who would be ready to meet him when he comes back. See, the fact is we can't afford to be like the people in Jesus' time who, who missed the prophecy they missed the signs. In fact, they didn't recognize who Jesus was, the Messiah, the very Son of God. You see, this prophecy doesn't tell us exactly when Jesus is coming back, but of course we already discovered in night one, nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. But it does tell us, though, that we're living in the time of heaven's final judgment. Today, we can be ready to meet him when he comes back because we have a Savior in heaven. And that's great news that we have Jesus, our high priest, standing there right now. In fact, there's nothing to fear about the judgment. Like I said earlier, the judgment is not meant to be something that we fear, but it's, we, can, we can look at it with great anticipation, with gladness and confidence, knowing that we have a high priest, an intercessor, we're all sinners, but we can be forgiven. We have a Savior. And then remember, the Bible tells us where sin abounded, grace abounded much, much more. Hebrews 7.25 says these words, Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Notice those words don't say that Jesus sometimes lives or when he maybe feels like it that day. No, it says he always lives to make intercession for them. Friends, I've said this. It sounds like a, a worn down story by now. But Jesus is standing in heaven right now, interceding for you and for me. In fact, he's the best lawyer money can buy. He's never lost a case. And the good news is he's waiting to represent you tonight. You have the best advocate out there waiting as Jesus speaks to your heart tonight. I want him to, to just reveal to you maybe a truth that you didn't know about him before you joined the session. But I pray that as he speaks to you, you take his hand of help. Lean on him. You can trust him. He's your friend. And he's your savior. And so tonight, I just want to pray. But I want to pray a prayer that will bring peace and comfort over you if you have ever thought about the judgment, the return of, of Christ, and maybe you dreaded it. But tonight, I want that to all change. And hopefully it has already. As maybe you have a new picture 
of Jesus. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just praise you for this time that we have got to share together once again. Lord, I praise you for the fact that you've never left us alone. Lord, I praise you for, for being our atoning sacrifice. You didn't have to do that, Lord, but you did. In fact, the word tells us there is absolutely nothing that you won't do for us. You've done it all, Lord, and you've given us grace on top of everything. Now, Lord, I just pray if there is somebody out here tonight that's listening, that maybe at, at one time or maybe it was just a few moments ago before they heard this message was, was timid or scared to come to you, to that throne room of grace. Lord, I just pray that they can come now boldly like you said in your word because, God, you are a good, good father to us. And, Lord, we lean on you knowing that you're able to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. So I just pray that you give each person tonight listening just a spirit of peace and comfort, knowing that you are here with them. Lord, once again, I praise you for your word, and I just praise you for each person that has taken time out tonight to join us. Bless each one. It's my prayer. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Before I go, though, I just want to remind you, we have another session coming up on Friday night. So please come back. It'll be at 7 p.m. And we're going to keep this momentum going, talking about how good God really is and his son Jesus, because we're going to be talking about the second coming of Jesus. That's the title, the second coming of Jesus. Friends, you don't want to miss, out that, miss on that presentation. We're going to be revealing some uh, scripture verses that tell us how exciting that day will be. In fact, it's the best thing that is yet to come. But I guarantee you come back, you check it out, you'll be just as excited too. So I want to thank you for joining us once again. But you guys have a good night. Have a blessed one. I'll see you later.